Hey guys, we're going to do our quick notes today, so if you will take out your sheet that has a pancreas on the bottom of it, we are going to cover the accessory organs of the digestive system and the large intestine. So it's only 11 slides, it'll go pretty quick, and then after that you will watch your Magic School Bus video and answer the questions that go with that, and then work on your review sheet for your quiz on Monday. Your quiz will cover all of the digestive system information as well as the digestive system stems. So don't forget to look at those um, uh, for Monday. All right, so let's look at accessory organs. This is our first um, picture that we need to label. Let me go back so you can fill in accessory organs on your slide. All right, so accessory organs are any of the organs of the digestive system that are going to aid in digestion, they do not have food travel through them. So the pancreas, the liver, the gallbladder, and the appendix are going to aid in digestion by either making enzymes or making bile. And um, but, but again, no food will travel through these. All of their secretions are going to be emptied into mostly the duodenum and small intestine. All right, so let's look at this image here. This is our liver um, up towards the superior portion. And the liver is a little bit elevated here. We know that it will kind of sit down um, on the gallbladder and the gallbladder will be hidden underneath the liver. But this is liver tissue here. The hepatic duct will drain the bile that is made in the liver and the bile will be stored in the gallbladder. Okay. No bile is made in the gallbladder. It is just a storage container, a little Tupperware container for the bile that is made in the liver. When you eat fatty foods, the gallbladder um, senses that more bile needs to be released because the purpose of bile is to help emulsify or mix those fats. So the gallbladder will deliver that bile fr um, from the inter interior portion of it through the cystic duct. That'll join in with the common bile duct, which you can see running here. Whoops running here, and it will empty into the duodenum, which remember is the first little bit of the small intestine. We also have the pancreas. Looks like a sponge that will sit behind your stomach. Inside of the pancreas, we have our pancreatic duct, where all of the pancreatic enzymes will be um, released into. The enzymes will travel through this pancreatic duct, also join in with that common bile duct, and empty into the duodenum. All of the digestion that occurs in the duodenum is, is gonna be super important for uh, nutrition and, and absorption. Um, without the pancreas, without the gallbladder, without the liver, without those enzymatic properties, um, our digestion cannot occur efficiently, which can lead to malnutrition and malabsorption. All right, let's first go to the pancreas. So it has an endocrine and an exocrine function. If we go back to our gland notes, the endocrine uh, glands are gonna secrete their hormones directly into the bloodstream, whereas exocrine glands are gonna secrete their product through a duct and then out onto a surface. So the pancreas can do both. The endocrine function of the pancreas is to uh, make and secrete hormones like insulin, that will regulate your blood sugar. Insulin will bring your blood sugar levels down. And that is, um, or, or insulin is gonna go directly into the bloodstream and have very widespread and systemic effects. Whereas the exocrine function of the pancreas is just gonna be where the pancreas will make the digestive enzymes like lipase, amylase, and protease, push those secretions into the pancreatic duct, and then the pancreatic duct will lead into the common bile duct, uh, which will empty into the duodenum. We did these enzymes yesterday. Okay, all of these enzymes are made by the pancreas, again, delivered through the duct to the duodenum. The um, lipase, or lipases, the enzymes that will break down fats, um, are called lipases. They will break down your fats into a glycerol and fatty acids. Amylases will break down starches. Okay, starches can also be called polysaccharides. So make sure you know that those terms are interchangeable. Polysaccharide, if I can spell. 
There we go. Um, starches are the same things as polysaccharides. Amylases will break down those uh, polysaccharides into disaccharides. And proteases will digest proteins into your polypeptides. Okay, so all of that is just a little bit of a review from yesterday. The liver's function is to make bile. And we always use the word emulsify when we think about bile, which is going to help mix and break down fats. It also serves as a detoxification center. Um, any toxin, any medication, any drug um, that comes into the body has to go to the liver to be detoxified and processed. It will store excess iron. Um, if we have too much or if we have um, any extra iron laying around in our bodies, they will, it'll go to the liver and be stored, um, as well as vitamins A, B12, and D. If you remember back to vitamin D synthesis, once this uh, sun hit your skin, the first place that the precursor of vitamin D went was the liver to undergo its first hydroxylation. And so it'll temporarily stay in the liver, and then remember it goes again to the kidney for its second hydroxylation, so it can become the 125-dihydroxy vitamin D that we um, use in our bodies. The liver is divided into lobes, and um, you can have a liver lobe removed if it's cancerous or if it's starting to show signs of cirrhosis, and it will regenerate itself. So that's the only organ in the body that will regenerate itself. And if there is uh, liver disorder or liver disease, it can lead to jaundice, which, remember, is the yellowing of the skin or even the sclera of the eye. Gallbladder is next. Gallbladder and liver go right together. The gallbladder is going to be the storage center for bile. And the hepatic duct will join in with the cystic duct from the gallbladder and form this common bile duct, which empties into the duodenum. Uh, this is going to help break down fats in the small intestine along with uh, pancreatic lipase, which will continue to break down uh, the lipids into a glycerol and fatty acids. The appendix, um, now that we're moving into the large intestine, um, this would be your accessory organ of the large intestine, is just a pinky sized worm like appendage or um, kind of a, a worm like hallway, dead end hallway is what I think about, uh, that's going to hang off of the cecum of your large intestine. Remember that your ileum is going to empty into the cecum. So the ileum is the last part of the small intestine. The cecum is the beginning of the large intestine. The appendix will hang off of that cecum. It does house a lot of bacteria. Um, it can get inflamed and cause an appendicitis. And if it ruptures, then all of that bacteria and yuckiness will spill out into the abdominal cavity and can lead to peritonitis. But most of the time, if it's not bad enough, it may just cause some pain. If it's not large enough, they will not remove it. They hopefully just treat it with medication. But um, if they need to remove it, then they will perform an appendectomy and just nip it out, and you'll be back to school in a couple of days. All right, the large intestine is the last organ that we're going to go through in the uh, digestive system. And we're first going to go through the parts of the large intestine, then the functions, and then I have two quick disorders that we'll go over about it. All right, the part uh, or parts of the large intestine, we've already done this when we labeled the um, big diagram of the digestive system, but it's split up into the cecum, the ascending colon, then we have that hepatic flexure, we'll run across the belly through the transverse colon, then we have our splenic flexure which leads into the descending colon. Sigmoid colon is where uh, we take that sharp S curve, and then that's going to lead to the rectum and the anus. It's called a large intestine because it's bigger or wider in diameter than the small intestine, but it's much shorter in length. So I always think about it forming like a little picture frame around the uh, small intestines. The cecum is the first part that will connect to the ileum. Let me move this up a little bit. There we go that will um, connect to the ileum of your small intestine. <clears throat> you have an ileocecal valve right there, which will allow the passageway of food from that ileum into the cecum. Remember, the ileum is I-L-E-U-M. Be careful with the spelling of that. And it's unidirectional, so we should not be getting any backflow 
of um, feces through the colon, and the colon and the large intestine are the same thing. So those terms are interchangeable. Functions of the large intestine. The main function in the large intestine is the reabsorption of water. Okay, no digestion is going to occur in the large intestine. Everything is done through the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. And once you are in the large intestine, you are only going to reabsorb water. You can also absorb sodium and vitamin K, but it's going to serve as like a trash compactor and will push and absorb water and push and absorb water through peristalsis and that's going to form your feces and then store it until it is expelled from the body. Feces is mostly water, about 74% water, undigested material, mucus, and bacteria. Most people think bacteria are bad, but if we didn't have bacteria in our small and large intestine, then digestion would not occur. And so we have good bacteria and bad bacteria. When you eat yogurt, it tells you on the back, what are the probiotics in that yogurt? The probiotics are good bacteria that are going to replenish and um, help with digestion in the large intestine and small intestine. It is not just about making poop. You have to think about how do I make that and then what can affect that long term or what can affect that if you were to be constipated, if you had diarrhea, if you're on antibiotics. If you go to the doctor and they diagnose you with strep throat, they'll give you a high power antibiotic. That antibiotic doesn't know to just kill the bacteria in your throat. It may also kill some of these bacteria that are in the large intestine. So you have to replenish those. Most doctors will tell you to eat yogurt along with that antibiotic because if you uh, kill the gut flora or if you kill off the bacteria that are found in your gut, it can lead to unwanted side effects like diarrhea, which is one of the most commonly listed side effects um, on your little packet of information that comes with your medication. Um, let's look at two disorders real quick of the large intestine. The first one is um, diverticuli. Some people will call this, or inflammation of those diverticuli would be called diverticulitis. And this is a cross section of the large intestine. And if you have an outpocketing or a little pouch that um, extends itself from the side of the wall of the large intestine, it is called diverticulum if it's one, or diverticuli if it's more than one. And many times bacteria and excess feces can get caught in that diverticulum and can harbor bacterial growth and may eventually rupture. So just the inflammation of it is called diverticulitis, but if that were to rupture, then you have, um, a, a, all, you have spilled all of that bacteria and grossness into the belly, and they need to go in and fix that. It will not wall itself off. Many times they'll have to go in and remove sections of your large intestine that have diverticulosis, which is the condition of many of these outpocketings or many diverticuli. You may also hear about polyps. Um, polyps are not outward growths, but they are growths that occur on the inside of the lumen of the um, large intestine. It's recommended to get colonoscopies once you reach a certain age, and if you have a history of uh, colon cancer, I couldn't think. Colon cancer in your, in your family, they recommend them at an earlier age. But this is a growth of the tissue of the large intestine that can almost form a little tumor. So you can think about a tumor and a polyp being very similar. It may or may not become cancerous. So if you catch these polyps quick or early enough, they'll go in and just cut them off. And um, it really prevents the chances of colon cancer. A polyp can turn cancerous and then metastasize into other parts of your body. So that's why it's super important to have the colonoscopies when recommended because if they take these polyps out early enough, you drastically reduce your chances of colon cancer. All right, let's um, think about what we have left for today. You are going to watch your Magic School Bus video and answer the two pages of questions that go with it. And then after we're done with that, you will work on your review sheet for your quiz on Monday. Your quiz will cover all digestive system information as well as digestive stems. Email me if you have any questions.